All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. And I am so excited to be here today on Monday, June the 27th for our Health and Safety Committee meeting. I'm going to start off really quickly here, taking a quick roll call of the committee. And when I call your name, please say here. So first up, Vice President Jones. Here. And then Board Member Moffitt. Not here. Board Member Moffitt. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I am here, Board Member Weinberg. Um, for those of you who have tuned in virtually, the documents that we'll be reviewing for uh, this particular meeting are available via Board Docs. And, of course, you can go through the CPS website in order to see the materials. Members of the public, public excuse me, who wish to speak may do so by clicking the chat button. Um, the chat feature will be open for your request for three minutes. And please submit your name, your affiliation to the district, your school, community, your topic, and your contact information if you want a direct response to any questions that you may have. Um, we have a wonderful short agenda today. Um, but first up, we will have Vaping Education Pilot, which will be presented to us by um, the Sensei Health Department. So welcome, welcome. And it's all yours. Well, hello. Thank you for having us here this afternoon. Um, we're from the Cincinnati Health Department, and today we're going to speak about something that is very near and dear to our hearts, and that is the tobacco vape epidemic and how it affects our youth today. So my name is Courtney Calvin. I'm with the Cincinnati Health Department as a tobacco-free living coordinator. Um, in this role, I go out and at, do a lot of education with the public, particularly schools surrounding vaping. We write policies and procedures for companies, organizations, and businesses as well. So vaping is our thing, um, and that's what we do well. Hey guys, my name is Melina Harris, interim public health educator at the Cincinnati Health Department in the Tobacco Free Living Program, working alongside Cal Courtney Calvin. Um, we go into the communities and raise awareness about vaping and how it's affecting our youth. On today's agenda, we will give an overview of the um, in-depth programs, the intervention for nicotine dependence, education prevention, and tobacco and health. We're going to discuss why the program is needed, facilitator training, as well as the next steps in the implementation process, and two of the Cincinnati Public Schools, Walnut Hills and Western Hills High School. Slide, please. Uh, the in-depth program is an alternative to suspension um, program offered to those youth that are in violation of the tobacco policy at their school. Um, this program is used instead of out of school, alternative school or in school suspensions. Attendance is mandatory and any consequences for unexcused absences are determined by each school. Also in your folders, um, there is the presentation. Um, you can jot down any notes um, next to each slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the program can be implemented in a one-on-one -on -one session, but it's recommended in groups. So these students can have conversations, exchange ideas and opinions um, about their tobacco usage. It can be offered before, during, or after school, as long as the facilitator and the student schedules line up. It's also implemented in four 50-minute sessions. Um, session one discusses tobacco usage and vape. In this session, students will identify their reasoning for using tobacco products, as well get an overview of the program and what is um, needed from them in this program. Session two will discuss nicotine dependence, what nicotine does to the body, how it affects the mind, um, as well as an overview of tobacco products that are on the market. Session three will discuss establishing healthy alternative. Students will Try to identify coping mechanisms in order to work through cravings and triggers that they have for nicotine. Session four, we'll talk about making the change to be free of all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. And in this session, students will try to implement a plan to work through those cravings and those triggers to be tobacco free and to be tobacco free for a lifetime. Next slide, please. Why is in-depth needed? Well, tobacco is a major issue in our community. It's in health, economic, social injustice, environmental issue. Tobacco usage is correlated with low income um, as well as low education. 
Youth are also targets for the tobacco industry. A tobacco company founder once stated, today's teenager is tomorrow's potential regular customer, and the overwhelming majority of smokers first begin to smoke while they're in their teens. The adolescent brain doesn't fully develop until about the age of 25. So students that are using vapes and smoking cigarettes, they're becoming addicted, and they will become lifetime tobacco users. A lot of adults and youth don't know the effects of vape on their bodies not aware of the products that are out in the market, as well as vaping is something that is newer than cigarettes. So we don't know the long-term effects of vapes. So unfortunately, our youth will be the cadavers that will be used 50 to 60 years from now, and then we will realize the harmful effects. Next slide, please. Thank you. Also, the vape world is forever changing. These are some new products that were brought to our attention. Um, a vape hoodie, a book bag, and a vape watch. All of these are very disguisable, uh, marketed to our youth. They also have nicotine toothpicks, nicotine um, Tic Tacs. Um, these are all things that our youth use, very disguisable, um, and we just want others to be aware that these items may come up on your campuses. Well, that slide is coming up. I'm actually headed to the airport from here to go to a national tobacco conference. And so I'm hoping that I bring back some information definitely that can be useful for us as we move forward with implementing this plan. It looks like it is a district driven initiative. Um, and we've also received um, positive feedback to roll this out in Wana Hills High School and Western Hills High School, meeting with both the principals and the staff over the course of the last six months. So there are some stats, as you see there, about why in-depth is needed. Um, 1,900 kids under the age of 18 try smoking for the first time every single day in our country. 6,100 kids under age 18 try vaping every single day. 5.6 million kids under the age 18 alive today will ultimately die from a tobacco-related illness. Next slide. So facilitator training. Facilitators are going to be the backbone of this project. Each school nominated two adults to facilitate this program in depth. We really want the facilitator to be a trusted adult, a trusted teacher, a trusted nurse, or a counselor. So both schools have already identified the two people that they would like to facilitate this program. Um, registering for the program is free about 45 minutes for each adult to be trained. It's a self-guided, self-facilitated assessment. The training that the facilitator will receive covers the history of in-depth. Why did it start? Why is it important? Where has it been rolled out to? It's been in prisons, it's been in parochial, it's been in public schools, and has been very effective. 60% of those students who have gone through the program have admitted that they've tried to stop using tobacco products which is a win. Facilitators will also take a pre and post survey, and we're gonna use this data from the students as well as from the facilitators to track and see how effective this program really is in Cincinnati. So what's in it for the students? Why should the students go through this program? It's probably what you're asking. It's at no cost to CPS. CPS will not pay a single dime for this product. It is 100% free. It's going to teach and reinforce model behaviors. It's also going to prepare students for smoke-free environments. So University of Cincinnati, Xavier, all of our colleges locally are all tobacco-free. And so this will prepare them to go into that environment, as well as the workforce and the Air Force. Students' needs will be addressed. They'll learn about the misconduct of tobacco use and learn about the root cause of the problem. Students will be encouraged to create a post-survey and a pre post and pre-survey, excuse me, where we're going to use that data to track. Was this really effective? Did the students really gain something um, from being going through this program versus being suspended when they are caught using vape? Next slide. So the pilot. Cincinnati Health Department has been awarded a $50,000 grant from Interact for Health to help us roll out this project here. So we're going to roll this out, hopefully, the start of the school year for one year, again, in Western Hills High School and Wana Hills High School. 
And with that 50K, we're really going to educate our facilitators using that money, and we're also going to pay them. We want to pay our facilitators. They'll receive about $250 each quarter for implementing this program. We realize teachers work super hard. Um, a lot of times they do things outside of work, and they're not compensated. So this is the least that we can do. We're also, in one year, we're going to send those same facilitators to a national tobacco conference where they themselves, such as I today, will go away to a major city and learn about tobacco and vape use and be able to bring that information back and share it with the other schools. Once students complete the in-depth program, we're going to offer them a cessation program strictly for teens called My Life, My Quit. That is for teens 17 and under, confidential. Um, it's a program where they'll learn about cessation materials and get them to quit using tobacco and vape products. Next slide. So next steps. Next steps for this pilot project, we're looking to have a letter of intent signed um, stating that we have the green light to roll this project out into those two high schools. We're going to plan assemblies, then letters to the parents stating that this is a program rolling out as an alternative to suspension. We're looking at doing feedback sessions, conduct tobacco take backs, which has worked very well with adults in the neighborhood. So students will be able to give us tobacco products to be disposed as they are very harmful for the environment. And in exchange, they could potentially receive a gift card for doing so. And then we're going to plan a youth focus group. And hopefully that focus group will be able to come before you in one year and explain how they kicked the habit, how the pilot worked, and would they roll this pilot out to their peers. And that wraps our presentation. We are so delighted to be before you. I know that was very brief. But if you have any questions, our contact information is on the next slides as well as in your handout. Please reach out. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. And I just have a couple of quick questions that I would like to ask. Um, thank you so much for presenting on vaping. Vaping is its so big. It's actually going down into the elementary ages as well. Um, I was a teacher for 11 years. Fourth graders, fifth graders, sixth graders, they are starting to vape. Um, my concern or question, I guess, regarding this program, it is more for the individual who is being not suspended, but given this as a way to intervene. What can be done to our students of this district so that it's not happening? I have a eighth grader and for example, she is exposed to vaping at her school, but she's unaware of it and she had no idea what it was until she saw it. What can we do for the students to ed help educate them before they start? Absolutely. Great question. Thank you for your 11 years of service as an educator. Um, so with that, um, this program, we will go out and do some kind of preventative. So I've also been invited by health teachers to go into the classroom to teach. And you're absolutely right. We're seeing as young as nine being introduced to vape products in their school bathrooms. As you saw the products that Melina discussed, there's book bags, there's hoodies, there's all kind of things that are um, created by design to get our young people to engage in this unhealthy behavior. So we would love to be able to go out to every school. I know I've done, I spoke to more kids, some students at more program and anything that I can get my hands on as a preventative measure, I am all in um, to go out and do so. Thank you. Any other board members? Um, 20 seconds. Tell me 20 seconds. <laughs> you know, that's the wrong thing to tell me. All right, Courtney, I'll be, I'll be brief because I know you and I love you to death. Um, and I do have questions. How did we land on just Walnut Hills and Western Hills? Um, so because, a, because I know this is needed at, at all of our high schools particularly. Okay, everybody wants to raise their hands. So that was, must, must have been a good question. So that's a really good question. Um, so we were looking for two high schools to really roll into. And um, first we chose Dater and West High just because they share the same campus. And then it was approached to me um, by somebody um, with CPS and said, how about Walnut? And we were like, absolutely. Um, and for me, speaking to other parents and some of my friends who kids go to certain schools, they're like, that's a good choice. Let's roll this out. So the goal, even though we're only choosing two schools to pilot the program, our hope is that in 23-24, every 7th through 12th school will adopt this 
this model. Um, even next year, maybe go down to elementary. We, we are seeing that there as well. But I think the preventative um, should happen at elementary level um, and then go to high school. But that's how we kind of landed. It was brought to us to know. But somebody else may know why Walnut was chosen. <laughs> I have more questions for you, but definitely want this one answered. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to tag in. So this was heart work for former board member Melanie Bates. And so she um, really spearheaded this work. And the way that the decision was made to really engage with the two schools that were mentioned was we looked at the highest um, disciplinary rates around vaping for those two schools. Okay. And that's why we started where we were. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was a good, that was, <laughs> I like that. And then uh, another question that I had around, and I think you answered it, but I want to make certain that I'm clear. Um, are you going to give the students an, a survey when they get there for their learning of tobacco and, and vaping and then like give them the lesson and then give them another survey afterwards just to kind of capture some data? Another good question. So yes, students before they go through the program, once they're referred, they'll receive a pre-survey. What do they know about vape? What do they know about tobacco? Do they know how it affects them? And then they'll go through the four sessions and then they'll be given a post survey in hopes that they learned enough to be able to document this and deter away from tobacco and vape. That information will be given to us quarterly by the facilitators that we're gonna face-to-face -face meet with each quarter. And then we'll come back and have the data that will hopefully support the need to implement this model in every seven through 12 high school. Okay, um, I promise just two more. So um, more. you can email. Yes, I can email you, but I'd like to ask my question. <laughs> so, um, um, let me forget mm -hmm. my my thought. Oh, what happens to the things that you the the contraband that's gonna like? What's going to happen? Because you mentioned the gift card for them to turn in things. What's going to happen to those things? So we'll work with another organization to dispose those in a healthy manner because they are very toxic to our environment. A lot of people don't realize that even cigarette butts. They are the number one polluted item in the world, and most people don't know that. So we'll discard those for um, those high schools um, in a healthy way. We're also looking at having disposal boxes located on the campus, maybe one or two, where students can just drop the products that they find, that they've used, that they're like, I don't want to use this anymore, and we'll go and discard those. And those will be set up like a post box where you can drop, but you can't take Gotcha. in hopes that that kind of is more safer, safer option. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll definitely email the rest of my questions, but um, I hope to see this is important information for even athletics and how that impacts mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. athletes. I think it'd be great, even if we could get a box at every school, and then we could maybe see what's being turned up. So thank you so much for the information. Absolutely. I'll give back my time. I think we have one more question. Before. I noticed that in your presentation, it is identified as an alternative to suspension program. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, the, we're, what's happening is kids, the students are being suspended for violating the smoking rules. Yes, your okay, discipline so you policy. Have, you have a captured audience there. So, aside from discontinuing the smoking, the, the vaporing, what, do you have other measures of success? That, that would allow them to get back into the classrooms and with an expectation that they not vape? Are there other measures that can be um, ascertained from the program? So right now, that is the number one measure, just the decreasation of suspensions. Um, but we can also look at the health risk. How many physicians at Children's Hospital are seeing less children taking vape? How many students have been prescribed a nicotine replacement therapy product. And so we'll kind of loop all of those together and be able to use those and have a better assessment of measures for you. Thank you. Excellent job. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Much needed. Very, very needed. All right. Up next, we have uh, Mr. Eric Kearney. He is our government liaison. He will be presenting to us some information um, about some of the different bills that are going on either at the State House or beyond. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the um, 
Health Committee. I, I submitted my report uh, this morning. I apologize. It was uh, it was late, and so that was 100% my fault and nobody else. Um, okay, so in terms of bills, what happened uh, recently this, this past week in the um, the Ohio General Assembly is uh, House Bill 583, which you may remember was first about substitute teacher shortages. It became a Christmas tree bill, kind of like what happens during lame duck before a session ends. So I'll go through um, 583 in, in detail a little bit later. Um, as you know, last week, Governor DeWine signed House Bill 99, which allows teachers to uh, carry firearms in schools with uh, 24 hours of training. Uh, also included some information about the um, State Board of Education, which recommended increasing the test scores students must achieve in order to pass the third grade English test to be promoted to the fourth uh, grade. That's uh, went from 683 to 685 and then 46 to 47. Um, also, the State Board of Education had uh, a presentation about learning loss during COVID and uh, districts being open and uh, being unopened. Also, I, I wasn't sure if the uh, board members are familiar with um, the uh, child enrichment, I mean, the educational savings accounts that are offered which are um, low-income families can receive a $500 savings account for each child for the purpose of learning opportunities uh, during the remainder of the school year and next school year. Uh, as of June 9, uh, Sue Cosmo, who is the Director of Office of Non-Public Education Options, at the ODE, Ohio Department of Education, said the department has a total of $106,000 in approved claims and 6,129 families who have received awards. Um, it's something that, that I think maybe we might want to take advantage of if we haven't um, already. Um, also, you, you probably heard in, in the news about the uh, school liability case it happened in Greenville City Schools where a student was bur burned in a um, chemistry lab. And so the, the lawsuit, uh, which is in front of the Ohio Supreme Court, challenges um, some of the immunity that school districts may have. So that's a, that's a case that um, we're going to um, obviously keep our eye on. Also, I included uh, in this report about the statewide campaigns and where they stand financially. I thought that might be of interest to, to you as we keep an idea of what is going to happen on, in the executive branch, the governor's race, secretary of state, attorney general, auditor, and treasurer. As you know, the election for the state house, the general assembly, is uh, in, in August. So um, getting to 583, so uh, there are a bunch of bills out in, um, in the General Assembly. You, you might remember there was at one point 145 of them that, that we were trying to keep track of. And so what they did was they took some of them and they merged them into 583, which is the um, bill that was about substitute teaching. And so they added to to it, um, not only substitute about substitute teachers, but the Ed Choice Scholarship Program. If there's an error in a payment, then it gets corrected. Expansion of the Ed Choice uh, Program, uh, uh, proration of expenses, Ed Choice expansion eligibility for siblings. So if one child, then the other child is automatically qualified. Quality community school support program, low performing community school sponsorship changes, uh, tutoring and remedial education program, dyslexia screening. So they added all of those into the bill and they passed it out as kind of like a Christmas tree bill with respect to education. Uh, word on the street is that the General Assembly will not return until November. And so that provides us with time to meet with our, our local representatives. So that's good and bad news, I suppose.
Can I just get clarification on House sure. Bill 583? Are you saying that it has been passed? Yes, it has okay. been. Making sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should have put it in bold, and I did not. But it has passed. Any questions from anyone? Board Member Jones. I, I, just a comment. This is yes, a board lot member. to soak in. Mm -hmm. You hear about it every day mm -hmm. on the news, what's happening at the state level and all of this. Is, uh, where do you think, they all are important, but in terms of priority or where we can kind of focus our emphasis on, where, where do you see that happening for us? Well, I think that um, for our school district, we, we need to focus on relationship building. And so I wouldn't say, you know, there, from time to time there are bills that are very important that we should keep an eye on, but really the, the uh, most substantive and most important work is relationship building. So that is uh, creating relationships between board members and the uh, people in Columbus, as well as our new superintendent and the people in Columbus. But that's really the most important thing. And so why do I say that's important? A couple of reasons. One is you're never going to know what's in, what's going to happen or what's going to pop up. I mean, that's decided behind closed doors by leadership. But you want to have a relationship with a state legislator when you don't need anything. Then when you do need something, they will be more likely to take your call, or they might say to you, X, Y, and Z is about to happen. Perhaps you, you should pay attention to that, or I would like to get your opinion about that. And so in those instances, I think that that's really the most important thing that we should do. Um, and, and I think we've got an opportunity now that they're, you know, they're gonna, not going to be in session for a while. I think that is it. The only other question that I have, but I think this will go for the administration, is looking into the educational savings account to see if our families are aware of that. So I'm um, just checking into that. I think yeah, I'm happy to help important. with that if I can. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a, you know, people can get equipment to help out of school learning. Oh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. All right. Thank, thank you, you so committee. much. Thank you. Up next, we have a lovely update on securing lead agencies. I'm assuming, Shauna, will you be doing that? Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. So the last time we talked, there were five schools uh, that still needed a lead agency. So the good news here is there is, at this point, of those five, one that is still vetting. So we're getting there. One, still vetting. One okay. school. However, sometimes uh, relationships don't work out. And so at this point, there are three schools that we have to add to the list because the school and the partner have decided they're not the best fit or there's some other interest for both parties. So we are going to continue to work with those three schools, uh, well, four, uh, including the one from the previous conversation, to get them a lead agency. Okay. Which, which schools don't have agencies? Don't have again. Agency. She asked which schools didn't have um, agencies, and which I know one, that this was board member which Moffitt's one still question. Does not, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Um, so we're still working with John P. Parker. At one point, they were looking at the why very carefully, but due to their uh, Vision 2020, they think uh, one of our outdoor partners might be a better fit for their direction. So we're uh, continuing to work with them to secure that lead agency. There's a couple of different directions they can go into with that type of work, so. so. So can you give me a listing of the ones that do not, that's not the only one, right? So now the three that we're adding uh, who have separated, um, are Ami is separating from Heartfelt Tidbits, College Hill is separating from ABC, and Data Montessori is separating from Learning Through Art. Uh, part of that is uh, we decided to pause a little bit for their leadership to get in place. Okay. Uh, Dater Elementary? Dater uh, Montessori, Dater Montessori Elementary. What was their What was their agency? Before? They were They were with leading through art, learning, learning through art.
So the other agency, like Kilgore, they've got an agency now. So Kilgore is actively uh, working through the process with ABC. Had not signed off yet, but they are actively working with uh, to secure ABC. I think I can say that out loud. So I'm going to count them as having no agency. <laughs> what are the other, because they don't have it yet. So The only what? other one uh, that we were working with before, John P. Parker. So we added uh, LEAP, didn't have one, now they have ABC. Um, South Avondale did not have one, now they have Gaskins. And so I mentioned Kilgore. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, we are now going to discuss other business. And I think here for other business, um, when it's a follow-up uh, with I think a security question in terms of when we had a security presentation. I know that there were a couple of questions. So my first question would be for administration. Um, I know we discussed having security in schools and wanted to just follow up in terms of will there be any type of plan meeting in terms of with our um, Office of Safety um, Services in terms of with our principals and with our teachers and with our staff in the particular buildings? I don't know if anyone wants to answer that question. I am I'm not aware, but I, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Um, we can follow up on that if you'd like us to. Sure, sure. And can you maybe may I ask a clarifying question mm -hmm. of, of our chairperson? Yes. Can, clarify, for, um, maybe I'm not understanding. You said a follow up to the meeting we had previously, mm -hmm. or any actions that have taken? No, a previous board meeting in terms of security oh, okay. from a security update. Okay. So. Welcome. Well, hello. Sure are you? Yes. Um, I you? think I think that uh, Ms. Solano jumped in to try to answer the question. Mm -hmm. I was coming through the back and going to sit in the back. She was out during the time that we had that meeting. Um, Would you so like you to answer ask the question one more time? Okay. I think I might be able to. Address yes. It. So the question wasn't just in terms of with our safety and security. I know you did a presentation on that, and the question is um, regarding our office of safety. Um, will there be any kind of correlation or collaboration? with uh, security personnel, with principals, with staff, in terms of having some type of meeting where everyone is on the same page, or to move forward for the next school year? Yeah, so it won't happen until everyone returns. Um, our principals leave on the 30th. They don't come back until August. Um, and so when they return, there will be conversation across the board in terms of a united presentation for each of the individual groups. Um, our security staff that are not working summer scholars are also leaving at that time. So when they return, there'll be refresher training with them as well. And who will be leading that training or refresher? It will be our Office of School Safety. I have a question. I want to follow up with that. So will the SROs be included in that safety presentation with the principals and the schools? So that's a conversation we're having right now with CPD. Uh, we have another uh, another upcoming meeting with them so that we can align the training across the board. We have one universal, um, so there has been universal training for them already, but it's really been more through um, the Safe Schools platform where it's um, online. And so this one is one that we're, we would do the same um, actual PowerPoint so that everyone gets the same PowerPoint, everyone gets the same information, and then there is an opportunity for review from there. And then my other question, and, and really these these questions come from community questions that I cannot answer, but they would like answered. So are are there are we going to have increased active shooter training for our staff and for our students? Is that planned? It's not planned in terms of I can give you an actual date right now, but right. we're in the process of planning right now. Well, that what I should say is, is the intention to have it. The intention the is to increase the, the, the overall, um, just all of the conversations around it. Um, the other part of that that came up as a part of the board meeting was follow up conversation with students as well. So that as we're getting ready to do the drills, we're talking to them about the drills, but we're also doing follow up conversation with them after the drills occur. So they really know that it's actually a drill. So all of that is just a part of our um, revamp implementation plan. We currently do not have that one written plan as we talked about before, but that's in progress. 
I think the community is just kind of like, are we thinking about it? You know, everyone wants to make sure that, that they're asking me questions, and I'm like, well, these are superintendent questions. Yeah. Um, and I think they're really, I mean, that's fair to say, what do we think, are we thinking about this? Is this something that right. is on our mind? Yeah, and not only are we thinking about it, as I've also shared with the board, uh, we are in, are in the process of planning the community conversation where we are bringing in additional agencies to talk through um, just how we're responding, what we're doing, how we're involved in that. Um, we look for that to be a panel type discussion where we have representatives from each entity. Um, right now, we've included um, the Urban League, um, the NAACP, the police department. Um, there are some faith-based organizations that are looking to be involved as well, um, including looking to include a parent, a school counselor, so that we have just a cross-section of voices. The date that we had initially selected, which I've shared this with the board, but this, I guess this is for the, the benefit of the public, the date that we had initially selected um, was the 2nd of August, which is the same day as National a day out with an officer that mm -hmm. evening. And so the next possible date is the third. So I'm just waiting back right now for a feedback from one of the partners to make sure that they're able to attend on the third. Otherwise, we will have to plan and move forward. We also um, looked at August and we talked about July, but we also looked at August instead because that's around the time that parents are really gearing up to get their children back in school. And so they're beginning to think about you know, what this looks like and what they may need to do differently. So that's where the August date came from. So as soon as we can get that confirmed, I was hoping I'd be able to have it by tonight. Um, I haven't gotten the response yet to have it by tonight, but if something changes between now and 6.30, I'll definitely share that with the board. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other business? All right. We have, we have come to the part of the meeting for hearing of the public. So please tell me, we have probably, what, 15 people that want to talk? Oh, I was hoping that there was someone. Now, I'm just going to point out that you cut me off, <laughs> and we still have time. I yes, and that's my perfect. I could that have is been perfect. asking my questions, y'all. Thank you, Board Member Moffitt. I know that you will email the question. It will be great. Well, guess what, everyone? <laughs> Having no other business, I declare this meeting adjourned at 4.38 p.m. Way to go.